Well, I had planned to shoot a video this weekend on uh, our camping trip. But uh, the weather had other plans. Clouds and rain. Although it looks like it's clearing up a little bit. It's wishful thinking. It ended up raining almost all day long. So here we are on a Monday night back at home. It was still fun to go camping, but uh, I didn't even get a chance to pull my astrophotography gear out of the trunk. The gear included the uh, very portable William Optics Z73 scope, which I got at Neef and I still haven't used. Uh, and I was really hoping to use it on that trip. So I'll be bringing it to the Cherry Springs Star Party in Pennsylvania, uh, which is this weekend actually. So I hope to see you there. So for tonight, uh, I'm going to have to settle with using the uh, ED-140 here at home. Things could be worse. The first time I had the ED-140 out, I captured M13, the globular cluster in Hercules. Perhaps you saw that video. The photo turned out great, but it was a star cluster, and uh, I was really curious to see what the ED-140 could do on a nebula. So my next target was the Crescent Nebula, NGC 6888 in Cygnus. It doesn't clear the roof of my house until about 11 p.m., but it's worth the wait. The filter I used to capture this nebula was the STC Optical Duo Narrowband Filter. So that's HA and O3 together. And uh, if you know anything about the Crescent Nebula, you'll know that those are the two prominent gases in that target. So needless to say, that filter is an excellent choice. The camera I'm using is the ZWO ASI 294. If you're asking yourself why am I using a color camera shooting narrowband, it's simple. The mono camera I have is uncooled. It's passively cooled and these are warm summer nights. So I've been cooling the uh, 294 down to minus 20 degrees. Uh, stays nice and icy cold through my imaging sessions. As you may already know if you read my blog post on this telescope, there's no dedicated field flattener for this scope yet. But Exploring Scientific promises me it's coming soon and they will send me a version. So for now, I'm using the Starfield 0.8 times reducer flattener, and it's actually working quite well. With the sensor size on the ASI 294, uh, only the very edges of the frame are starting to show um, oblong stars. So as long as I crop my target in the center, I get that 85% of the field of view is just fine. The ASI 294 MC Pro camera has been just a pleasure to use since I've had it. Uh, with only a few hiccups early on, I've really been enjoying this camera overall. So here you'll see the uh, STC Optical Duo Narrow Band Filter uh, threaded onto the field flattener. Um, but tonight I'm going to capture some broadband true color RGB, uh, being that it is a moonless night. And I've got lots of nine and a half hours to be exact of narrowband data on this target already. So I believe I left the Bader Moon and Sky Glow in here. Nope, <laughs> it's somewhere else. Where did I put that one? Ah, I remember where. My plan is to shoot full frame with the William Optics Z73. Uh, so I've got the flat 73 adapter on my Canon 5D Mark II. And I believe I threaded the moon and sky glow into the flattener. And I did. These, these moments may seem staged and like, oh, oops, where did I put that? But it's legit. It's just insane in here. Okay, we've got the Bader moon and sky glow filter. The two inch, which I will thread onto the field flattener here. I get a million questions about spacing and the flatteners. 
So with this field flattener, it says that it's recommended 55 millimeters of spacing between the sensor and the flattener, flattener reducer. So if I get this on with the, uh, with the attachment that came with the 294 here, and I've got my little ruler out, the sensor actually starts a little bit lower than the top, so you can't go from here. You gotta start about there. And if you look at it, I'm just at about 50 millimeters. So what that says to me is that I'm getting away with it for my size sensor, and I'm not seeing uh, the negative effects of, of the flattening at the edges of the field um, because of that sensor size. If I was capturing a larger resolution, I would definitely see that. Uh, and it's something I get asked a lot about, and it's, uh, it was kind of confusing to me. So I asked Steve from Ontario Telescope about it, and that was his explanation. He said that the sensor size was allowing me to, you know, get away with it. Um, because I couldn't understand if I had it so wrong, why was I getting sharp images? But then I thought to myself, hmm, maybe they could have been sharper. But anyways, so you want to pay attention to the uh, recommended spacing between the flattener and your sensor. Because if you're shooting full frame and you want a flat field right to the edges, and you don't have that spacing, uh, you're just not going to get it. And for the record, I never once said I knew what I was doing. it's going to be a late one tonight. Uh, it's about quarter after 10 and I haven't even polar aligned yet. Uh, but it'll be well worth it to get some true color RGB and some natural star colors on uh, the Crescent Nebula. Most of the images of the Crescent Nebula that I have seen really nice ones anyways are usually bicolor um, in narrow band HA plus O3 so uh, I don't think I'll be missing out on much by not adding the S2. The really cool thing about the Crescent Nebula is first of all you've got that rippling hydrogen alpha gas that uh, it, more, it looks kind of like a brain. I believe I've mentioned that before but it's the outer shell of O3 that really makes it and that comes in as kind of a, a ghostly blue surrounding it and that's the faint details you can only pick up uh, by shooting an O3 and by soaking in lots of time. In my narrow band images so far I did start to see that shell up here which was so exciting. Uh, I've never been able to get that before especially from the, uh, the backyard but that's, uh, that's the power of narrow band imaging. I've said it so many times before but I waited so long before I started using narrowband filters because I wasn't interested in creating any false color images or anything, but man, if you're in a, a light polluted area, it's like magic just seeing through all the crap. The William Optics Star Spikes Batnoff masks, the acrylic ones that are now built into the dust caps are incredible. They make focusing via live view, whether it's on a DSLR camera or a CCD so much easier. But whatever you do, don't drop it. More specifically, don't leave it on the scope as it's slewing around and falls off onto the pavement, shattering into three pieces. I fixed it. See that satellite go by? So I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but I can already see the Crescent Nebula in a two second loop. That is the power of a, oh look, another bright one going by. Ooh, what was that? All right, so if I bump up the exposure to 10 seconds, you're going to see the Crescent Nebula 
right in here. Okay, so it's it's just right here. You can just barely make that out. If we bump that up to 15, you'll see it for sure. So that's our target. Uh, we're pretty well dead on. I might move it down just a little bit. And then I'm going to start taking some... I think I'm going to go with 3 minute subs tonight. Uh, because, like I said, with the narrow band I was already able to capture some incredible details so what I'm going for tonight is more of the natural colors of the object and more importantly the stars around it. If you're just getting started in auto guiding or you're new to auto guiding altogether I can't say enough about this Altair GP Cam 2 AR130 Mono and the Starfield 50mm guide scope. If you can see the screen there so that's a one second loop with the uh, GP cam. I'm just going to adjust the, um, the focuser on the Starfield 50mm and just watch these stars come into focus. It's got a real smooth focuser. It's an unjustified thrill I get doing this part of the uh, equation, just focusing these stars because I just love how smooth it is. Look how sharp they're getting. As you can see, there's lots of stars in the field. So I'm just going to clear the mount calibration. And we're looping, got a one second loop. Uh, auto star select, so it's going to choose a star to do the calibration on. And then uh, we'll let it do its thing. Um, in case you don't know, um, I'm connected directly to the mount from my PC using the Ioptron uh, mount driver uh, uses the uh, ASCOM platform and it's called pulse guiding so it's going to send pulses to the mount to make uh, corrections for periodic error and um, auto guiding basically allows you to take long exposures five ten minutes even longer uh, with sharp stars because it's uh, constantly making corrections to stay you know, steady on your image uh, once you get it going, uh, as baffling as it may seem in the beginning, uh, it's really not something you have to worry about uh, when you have a system that works. And uh, like I said, I recommend the 50mm Starfield Guide Scope and the Altair GP Cam 2. I'll leave a link in the description for this if you want to get started in auto guiding. It's a pretty affordable setup and it works on uh, a variety of focal lengths and telescopes. You know, this is a big. 140 millimeter uh, refractor and uh, this tiny little 50 millimeter guide scope works just perfect. Come here, Ray. Come here. There's a good boy. Over here. Over here. Sit. Sit. Come here. Ready. I just got off the phone with Steve from uh, Ontario Telescope. Uh, who's my partner in crime and uh, my co-host of the Astro Backyard podcast and uh, he's having a rough night where uh, some things are going wrong and uh, boy that is not uh, exclusive to him those issues with astrophotography I've had so many I think the biggest difference is between guys like me and Steve and most of you that watch this channel and uh, the dabblers in the hobby is that the issues and the setbacks just make you want it even more. When I have a night that doesn't go well or I'm stuck in the winter with a month straight of clouds, oh, the desire to just capture some objects in space just grows stronger and stronger and stronger. And then when you finally do, my God, it's the best feeling in the world. I guess we're a little bit nuts in that way.